Hello, I'm Cheryl McCarthy of the City University of New York. Welcome to One to One. Each week, we address issues of timely and timeless concern with newsmakers and the journalists who report on them, with artists, writers, scientists, educators, social scientists, government and nonprofit leaders. We speak with each one to one. I'm pleased to welcome writer Barbara Garson to the program today. The author of several plays, including Mech Bird, and three books, including All the Live Long Day, The Meaning and Demeaning of Routine Work, in her latest book, she turns her attention to the economic realities that so many Americans are facing these days. Down the Up Escalator, How the 99% Live in the Great Recession has just been published by the Doubleday Division of Random House. Welcome. Thank you. Barbara, your book looks at how um, the recession, which started around 2008, about how it came about and how it has affected the 99%, those who are not in the 1% of Americans whose earnings have actually been going up dramatically. The people in your book fall into three categories, those who have lost a job, a home, or savings during the recession. When did you start um, researching the book and how many people did you interview before you started honing in on the ones that you used? Well, I started, oh, I guess, I guess maybe 2009, maybe the second half of 2008. And you're right, I hadn't honed in on the story at the beginning. I think my publisher expected a quickie book about a current phenomenon, uh, full of sob stories. And um, <laughs> I disappointed them. I didn't do it as fast as they expected. In fact, my editor kept sending me notes saying, you're just lucky this is going on. <laughs> it felt very bad to hear that. But um, I wound up writing a book about the last 40 years. I did what you said. I interviewed people who lost jobs and houses and savings and retirement possibilities in the recession. But I began to notice that all of them had been moving down in income and or security for the last 40 years, or their parents had. And it began to be a story with a little bit of a plot. That is to say, to make it simple to leave the people out for a minute, it began to be about <clears throat> something that started 40 years ago, a kind of a real attack on um, salaries and security, everybody being co-op temps and, and, and uh, that kind of jobs. <clears throat> and salaries had been stagnated uh, for most people and down for many since the 70s. And I began to see that what ended up as a, as a housing crash, a debt boom, was only because people weren't being paid enough to buy what they produced. I mean, productivity in those years, to 2007 to um, back to 1971, had gone up uh, almost 100 percent, 99 percent. Income stayed stagnant. We're in a country where we sell 70 percent of what we produce to each other. So if productivity is up, incomes are stagnant or declining, who's going to buy all this stuff? And what began to make sense to me was there was a series of debt crises because essentially we s employers said, I know what, instead of paying you to buy what, what you produce, I'll lend you the money. Of course, no one person made that decision, except for GM, which became a huge <laughs> lending company instead of a car producing company. GE too, actually. And <clears throat> but in general, that's what was being said to American workers. And so first, they were lent <clears throat> enough money to buy big things, cars, college educations. <clears throat> then it began to be really big things. daily expenses, okay. credit card loans to, to buy food for next week. I'll pay you back next week somehow. And finally, it ended with selling people houses they couldn't afford and then buying and turning over those mortgages. And of course, it was clear that they were made to people who couldn't afford it, but somehow when you securitized it, it became okay. And oh, in fact, you, you will learn how it became okay in the mm -hmm. book, but I'm not going to okay. bore you with and the so details And so you, have, you have really just summed up how the things, the events that set the stage for right. the recession we're so in right now. Right. So suddenly 
suddenly, you know, and that's who I'm interviewing, uh, people who lost a job, but they're white collar workers. And not only are they personally stopped from getting a job they had, but if they find a new job, it will be at lower salary. It'll probably be temp. I mean, even if they're bookkeepers or, or um, computer programmers or whatever it is, writers, right. they won't have a real job anymore. Dwayne, a character in your book, did all the right things and still was barely able to keep his head above water. Uh, yes, you he say died before the recession started. This is a guy I met when I worked in a GI coffee house, mm -hmm. anti-war coffee Who house. Who went to work for GM. Right. And kept ahead of all the, um, uh, he was very skilled. I mean, he used to fix every broken old Mimeo machine in our coffee house. But he kept his skills updated. Right. He did the programming that programmed other people. And what happened? He died before the recession. And I only used him in my preface when I suddenly realized what had happened. This guy who was like me in the 60s, so uh, b believing that jobs would get better, that, that things would be humanized, and he's worked so hard, and he dies leaving his children an underwater house. That Which means that more was children, owned than it was if worth. If his children could have sold the house, they would still own the bank $200,000, owe the bank. And so, advised by a lawyer, they sent the keys back to the bank. Because and walked away from the mortgage. Their, the rest of their inheritance was a $6,000 credit card debt. And you say his mistake was that he believed that if he worked hard, things would get better. Or, or at least, or, or a lot of people uh, felt that way, that they, uh, they counted on, on what, what, happened, what usually happens to grown-ups, that their salaries go up and that they become in a better position in their companies. And are able to leave something to their children. Right, or at least retire, or right. at least, and. Now he was able people, to retire, he was able to retire. Oh, no, 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 he died. He died uh, still at work. I see. But a lot of people that I spoke to felt very much like a personal failure. In other words, when you, when you are that, um, that very religious and um, I think, very right wing, but very right on uh, guy that I that I met in Indiana, and you have given your life to a company. In this case, it was a big box store. I wish I could name the store, but he's still working there. But his hours have gone from eight to ten to sometimes twelve. He's a manager, and he feels like he's made the personal mistake. Each time, maybe he should have jumped ship. Maybe he should have done this. This is a case where I introduced interviewed a father and son with the son also probably feeling that his father was a fool to do things for security. And I tried to point out to him that maybe a person might turn around someday and said, oh, look what I've done for security, but at least they got the security. Right. Let's talk about the, the members of the Pink Slip Club. Uh, Four college educated, I guess 50-ish? Yes, long -time a little below. Okay, long time workers at middle income jobs. Um, who found themselves out of work and unable to find These new full-time employment. These are New Yorkers. In fact, they were in and out of each other's apartments all the time. And I, it was just like Seinfeld, so I gave them Seinfeld names. I don't use real names. And so I had Jerry and, and Elaine, although Jerry is a girl in this, um, Geraldine. And they were so sure when the recession started, I met them at the very beginning. And they held a little meeting of what they called their pink slip club because they actually were all from the same church and found each other that way. Uh, happened to be a Wiccan church, but nonetheless, otherwise, they were very typical New Yorkers. And they were so sure at the beginning that, well, they, they were all stunned when they were fired. It always hurts, and I think I've recorded those moments pretty, pretty well, that moment of shock, and some people freeze and some people melt. But they said, well, let's get together for the next few weeks because when do we get to enjoy the city during the day? And they went to concerts and found free things to do and applied and applied and applied for jobs and began to realize that you send these applications into the void. No one even gets back to you to say the position has been filled. You keep talking as if you're up for this, you're up for that. It sounds like an actor who's always up for something. And I followed them for a year and a half and saw them have to go into their retirement accounts, have to 
take money from their parents, ha take in roommates. And I, could, I can't imagine more qualified people. They have, and none of, have any of them found jobs yet? Only part-time at half the pay for the hours. And right. I'm talking about... I'm and what are the chances of finding full-time jobs in the 50s? Only the most extraordinary luck. And I can tell you they won't get it by sending in the resume to someone who doesn't know them. Right. They're nice people, so someone who happens to know them and happens to have a job might do it. Right. Um, and meanwhile, as you said, people who, have rem who are employed full-time, like uh, Chuck Kenny working for Big Box, are not being treated well. No, and uh, as a matter of fact, the, the Pink Slip Club people, they're kind of sweet, and they're around, and um, I followed up with them. I created, I'd never blogged before, and I hate the idea because you're writing fast, and I write perfectly and slow. Uh, but I'm following up on these people. I created a website with the name of the book, downtheupescalator.com, and I've actually just called back all the Pink Slip Club people, and they've told me what they're doing, and in fact, one of them said, uh, oh, you had a book published? Then you must know some publishers, because that's the kind of work he did. Right. Uh, but of course, I don't know the people who do the printing of the books he did lay out. And he started telling me all the new classes he took and all the programs he worked that... But she'll know full-time work. Okay. We're going to take a short break, then we'll be back with more with Barbara Garson, author of Down the Up Escalator, How the 99% Live in the Great Recession, after this message. Did you know CUNY leads the way for students with disabilities? CUNY leads means linking employment, academics, and disability services. If you're a CUNY student with a visible or invisible disability, the City University of New York offers eligible students free career development and placement services. To find out if you qualify, visit cuny.edu slash CUNY leads. CUNY leads to the career I always wanted. Welcome back to One to One. I'm Cheryl McCarthy of the City University of New York, and I'm talking with Barbara Garson, author of Down the Up Escalator, How the 99% Live in the Great Recession. You interviewed a number of people whose mortgages are underwater, uh, who either bought houses that they really couldn't afford, or they bought houses they could afford, but then started you know, borrowing on them, or they speculated on real estate by buying an, a number of houses. And then when housing prices crashed, they found themselves underwater. I guess a big question is. It's a very uh, California story. It's not is such it a really? New York story. Okay. I mean, it's not such a New York story. So who's at fault here? I mean, is it the buyers? Is it the subprime lenders? Is it the traders who bundled up the bad mortgages and sold them to big investors? Are all of them at fault? Well, you know that the bankers that I interviewed in this book, uh, they, they're nice people. I even remember I even talked to one guy who did the arithmetic, did the math for making the, um, the bonds because of different amounts of risk. You have different percentage of interest, blah, blah, blah. Um, he was really at the center of that Right, system. the trader who, sec who right. securitized the, the right. mortgages, right. And um, he wasn't an, an evil guy. In fact, he was just a very ignorant, happy little MBA who, <laughs> who, <laughs> who actually said to me uh, that some of the books, that is these lo loans are in a big book, will be 300 pages. And I said, oh, my book will be about 300 pages. And he said to me, Yes, but the reason I'm paid so much more is because I create value. He said, I know you work hard, but, <laughs> but anyway, so his value crashed. But, but there's some... But the thing is that, remember what I started off saying, that if a bank has so much money, in other words, if there's so much inequality that ordinary people don't have enough money to spend, and the 1% is getting like 58% of the increase in value of production values between... Uh, 71 and 2007, that money is not money that they're spending on cars and houses. I wouldn't mind if they did. I'd like to look at their pretty fashions. That becomes investment money. That money is in the bank. And a bank can't lend its money to the bank, or it can't keep its money in the bank. And so the any any 
any kind of scheme that came up to pass that money along, to lend it to somebody, to get interest, to pass the bad loans, if you could, as fast as you possible. That's what the banks had to do. And if they didn't come up with one scheme, they would have come up with another scheme. Regulation, I'm not saying that regulation couldn't have kept it, this particular scheme in check. Um, but then when you have all the money, you kind of get <laughs> past the regulation you want. All I'm saying is no one I interviewed was a, ha, 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 I know this is going to fail, but I'll get the money and run. Um, but it sounds like the bankers are the, are the biggest villains. Well, the let's team. put it this way. Um, a lot of the poor people I interviewed shouldn't have made those loans. But it wasn't from a lot of poor people storming the banks and demanding credit that they got the credit. It was from the banks with these huge piles of money having to do something with it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Your third category of, of person that you write about are people who lost their savings and, and investments during the recession. There was Henrietta in her 80s who had worked hard at a modest job and was living on her social security and pension, living modestly, but has seen the value of her, I guess, her IRA tank. Prudence, who had been wealthy, uh, in wealth including from the sale of her New York apartment, but bought a house and renovated it and maybe went a little overboard on the spending. And then when the her investments went down, now found All that she was- All of them came back up, remember. Right, that's true. And the third one was Richard Bay, a former oh, right. he lost it high earning TV host who retired, put almost all of his money into a fund run by a friend and the fund was turned out to be poorly run and now is living. A friend is in jail right now. Is your friend is in jail run. and I, he's probably not going to get his money back or, or I most just of his heard money that. Back. I'm doing follow up. Okay. Uh, so wound up taking his pension early and moving to his parents' condo in Florida. They mirrored the experience of a lot of people who lost a good portion of their savings uh, and investments. Now, Henrietta did not do anything wrong. Did Prudence and Richard do anything wrong? Well, Richard, maybe you shouldn't put all your eggs in one basket, but he trusted his friends. But um, I use these people as examples of their tailing in the rich people. I mean, gradually, you know the stock market is up right now. Right. Gradually, their investments did come back. Not Richard's, gone 100%. He's just an example of a person who's very articulate at explaining what happens when you went from being comfortable to suddenly having to think about money. He's so startled at it. Right. He says, I don't know how anybody could live right. walking around saying, right. how much will this food cost me? But anyway, but the other two, their investments came back up. And you notice a lot of investments came back up. And the That's not a good thing. I mean, that's a sign about, it's good for you if it happened, I hope it did. But for the most part, that's a sign of this is a very strange recession where corporate profits and hence stock market investments came back up. And in fact, corporate profits are up oh, 25 percent since 25 to 30 and since the recession. And incomes are going down and down and down and down. That means we another Another debt scheme will be necessary. I mean, that means we just, we will be, the same thing will be happening again. Mm -hmm. At least that's what I think. Mm -hmm. Or else we're just on a, on a, I mean, it, it's as if the people running the country or big investors are saying, well, I give up on America. I'm going to invest abroad. I'm going to uh, produce abroad. And <laughs> this is what I'll do here is, uh, give money to politicians to make laws for me. That's the sense in which it's my country. Of all the people you interviewed, was which one story got well, to you the most? There was that lady where I started crying. I interviewed, I went to court in the morning and uh, on some other thing. And a woman says to the judge, a woman who was losing her house said to the judge, when will this happen, Your Honor? When will they come? And the judge all merely said, the house belongs to them. So I made an appointment to meet her that evening. She was a home care worker and she was leaving. And I met her that evening and when I saw her, she didn't know where she was going to be the next day. She didn't know when they would come. She would say things like, I hear they hold your stuff, I hear the sheriff holds your stuff for 10 days. I mean, she, she didn't know what was going to happen. And I heard how she lost her house. She had actually owned a house outright, and it was in a black neighborhood, a neighborhood where before they wouldn't lend, 
it was redlined, and now it's redlined in the opposite direction because big banks gave a lot of money to these little fly-by-night people that used to work there, and they did all their ugly fly-by-night schemes. So she refinanced her house in order to put down down payments on houses for her children. She knows that's a big mistake, but she did it. And after the death of one of her children and a funeral, I won't go into the whole story, she lost her house. Went through a lot of stuff to get around it. Was with a very bad loan company. And um, I, she said to me about meeting me, she thanked me for doing it. And I, I, I couldn't believe it. She would thank me for writing about her. I'm giving her no help. And she said, when you asked me to meet you, I prayed on it. I thought, what does she want from me? And then I decided, she's little. She can't hurt me. Oh, that, somehow that just got to me. And I just started tearing up. And I said, I'm crying because my books never hurt any, help anybody. My, I won't hurt you, but my books never hurt, help anybody. And she said, oh, I know what you mean. My patients all die. Because she was a home care right, attendant. Right. And, and by the way, to make a point that I've made over and over, when she bought her house and paid it off, she worked a regular job for as a jitney driver in an industry that paid regularly and that closed in that area. So part of her trouble was the falling for this foolish plan, but another part of her, you know, for a, a mortgage that had an unstated amount and it could just balloon up and she thought, she thought, she was under the mistaken impression that if she paid for two years, then it would go down like a reward for paying. Of course, it spiked right, up. Right. And, but, you also talk about some of these modif oh. modification uh, scams. You know, people are supposed, you know, and, and the federal government put up however much money to encourage banks to allow people to modify their loans, which means essentially to reduce the principal so that they have right. a chance or at of least making the, the payment. Or the interest, at least. Right. Yes. Uh, and a lot of these For the banks, it was all carrots, no sticks. They would get money from the government for making such a, such a reduction. But they had no rules by which they should or they had to or if it was in certain circumstances. They just did it. Meantime, everybody else, and they almost made none. The government acknowledges they were very disappointed with it. But people were involved in these very complicated um, negotiations with their banks. Meantime, all these phony companies arose to help you get that modification. And there was really nothing they could do to help you one way or the other. They're basically it's, taking your money. They're just taking your money. Again, I have to say, a lot in black and Latino communities. You know, 11% of black families lost their homes in this recession, and 17% of Hispanic families. So what do you think is the main lesson that one can take from your book, or the main mes message? Capitalism should... will do this to you over and over. <laughs> um, I guess I should, uh, readers will take messages from some of the people because people are learning to live different ways with this. So one message is don't blame yourself. Uh, uh, oh, well, okay, examine yourself if you were foolish, but don't think it's just you. What do you think needs to be done? And I know you got Money, gotta money, income, salaries, wages and salaries must go up. Now, it's strange that I should have to say that. That's old Keynesian stuff. That should be what the Democrats are doing, and I should be saying, let's have socialism. Mm -hmm. But in fact, I'm writing the book saying, wait, the problem here is lack of wages, lack of spending power. And I'm embarrassed in a way. Instead, I, I have shown sympathetic people and unsympathetic people on, on all sides. But I'm embarrassed to have to say, let's be nice, let's avoid some of this pain because it's good for the economy. But that's what I'm really saying. Mm -hmm. I would like to say let's be nice because it's nice. Well, it's a very interesting book. Uh, and I think it really does capture uh, what's happened to a lot of regular people in this recession. I want to thank Barbara Garson, the author of Down the Up Escalator, how the 99% Live in the Great Recession, which has just been published by the Doubleday Division of Random House. 
for the City University of New York and One to One. I'm Cheryl McCarthy. If there are any people you'd like to hear from or topics you'd like us to explore, please let us know. You can write to me at CUNY TV, 365 Fifth Avenue, New York, New York, 10016, or you can go to the website at cuny.tv and click on Contact Us. I look forward to hearing from you.